it's time for us to check back in with the nine brides in Granny Height. Actually, this is the last time we'll be checking in with them. This is the last reading of this book. If you've missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. Heber studied the situation. Tate's gone to bed till spring. He's in there with Bible, dog, whiskey, and tobacco. Watch him take wings and resurrect. He climbed the rock and reaching, laid a broad chunk of hemlock bark on the chimney top. In good time, the door bounced open. Uncle Tate, bearded and in his underwear, coughed and swore. Tears from the smoke coursed his cheeks. Come along, you worthless old sinner, and vote, whooped Heber Hardy. Bade Uncle Tate, I've given up the things of this world. I'm busy repenting. I'm spelling out the word, letter by letter, and if the whiskey lasts, I'll soon be to Exodus. Then here's where you exode, encouraged Heber, or eat hickory smoke till Gabriel toots. Us hardies are figuring to pound a ten-foot Democrat tree trunk down your Republican chimney. Let me get my pants on, gasped Tate. He added, I ain't the only holdout. Where's Belle Gunderson? Belle, Heber was thunderstruck. Belle's halfway up Coal Mountain. She's got neither cart to sit in nor mule to drag it. She's one of your Democrats, said Tate smugly. As that argument of a trevet sank in, my three boys pronounced Heber, and this Steve Podlasky feller, he's got strong arms, by holy are going to lug her down. Obe Hardy, startled, spoke for himself and brothers. She's four axe handles wide, Pa. Trail's perishing rough. Mr. Hardy, I'm a Republican, mentioned Steve. Mr. Hardy, my steppin' will go, promised Zelda. That's right, said Heber, principal above party. His eyes turned gun barrel blue. For Gunderson toters, get! It was high time to face the rest of the parade around. Zelda had began to worry. Would they reach the poles before closing? She did what she could to hurry them along. Ladisla still held the banner, refusing to yield it up. The pole was braced at his pants belt. Yosk wailed his kettle, and white-whiskered Grandsir Beckett helped keep feet lifting with his goose call. The three at the head of the rabble reminded Zelda of something, of a picture, that was it, of a young man, kind of like Ladislas, bearing the colors, with a hollering boy beating a drum at one side of him, and an old man with a rag around his head playing on a fife at the other. Where she'd seen the picture didn't matter now. What counted was getting the laughing, scrabbling mob down slickery slope and over swollen creek without loss of a minute or of odor. She trotted along the flank of the parade, urging it to stride faster. At twenty minutes to seven, the throng burst into the schoolhouse to the exclamations of the officials and a pleased look of Grandpa Pudlaski, who was hungry for his borscht. Every reachable voter in the precinct was there, except Belle Gunderson and those who had gone to fetch her. There was also most of the children and all of the dogs. At the search for the booths, Land of Dan, exclaimed Granny Height, her eyes misty bright with understanding. Corey, too, regarded it with a shining wonder. But Zelda was in a fret, lest the final few be lacking. My steppin' has voted, but not the three Hardys and Mrs. Gunderson. Will they come in time? At five minutes to seven, the Gunderson party arrived also. Obe and Hake and Jim Hardy, any one of whom could claim to be the biggest man in the hollow, were sorely out of breath. Steve Pulaski looked as if his arms were pulled from their sockets. He glared reproaches at Zelda. On every stump this bell sits down, he said. On every rock, at all upgrades we pull, we push. At every dam we break. From holes of mud we hump, we pry with fence rails. Democrat, she should be GOP elephant. In truth, most of Belle stuck out into the classroom as she wedged into, or rather girded herself, into the booth. As Belle's folded paper slid into the box, seven o'clock, polls closed, pronounced Tecumus Hewitt. Tellers count the ballots. Friends, this is the biggest turnout Cat Tracks precincts ever had. I'd kindly like to know just what happened. 
It was the flag, said Zelda simply. And the drum, Mama, spoke up Joseph. And Mr. Beckett's goose honk helped, said Zelda, wanting to be fair. Granny Height called out, Zelda Pulaski, suppose you tell something more about that flag. We know you ran home and made it. Tell these neighbors now exactly what you made it of. Scrap, said Zelda, out of rag bag. She couldn't say any more. It had been an emotional day, and there had been many weary miles. Strength was drained out of her. Then I'll put in my word, said Granny. Folks, in the outlandish place she comes from, there was once a picnic. Springtime it was, murmured Zelda. In Grojek, her voice was flat. But down the road, people came running. Behind them charged soldiers, charged police. Zelda put her face in her arms against Steve's back. Zelda snatched some of her children to safety, but there was a little boy in blue velvet jacket and cap and a small daughter in a red picnic dress and white apron. Zelda raised her head. It is enough. We must go home now. No, said Granny. I want the neighbors to hear every bit. David went down under the hoofs. Young Ladislas here tried to pull his cousin, Jadwiga, into a house. A soldier shouted, let go. The boy refused. Zelda was on her tired feet. Come, children. Come, Stepan. Papa. Granny Height drove on. With the hand that is left to him, Ladislas Podlaski today carried the flag of his new country to every house in this district. I'll let you guess what scraps that flag was made of. Zelda was stumbling out. Mrs. Podlaski called Corey Peeler. Before you go, the paper flag on our wall has gone to pieces. I'm sure the men will fix our roof. Now they see how it leaks. Would you be willing to give us your flag? In the doorway of Peckerwood Schoolhouse, Zelda turned. Such a poor flag it is, just basted. It shall hang above our clock forever. We couldn't ask for a finer. Please, Mrs. Podlaski, thought Zelda. David and Jedwiga will be here, in this school always. Yes, yes, she cried. My friends, the school can have it. Heber Hardy plucked Steve by his leather sleeve. Belle wants to know when you boys are going to tote her back up the mountain to where you fotched her from. She's waiting. You come to hell, said Steve Podlaski, citizen. Granny Height versus the United States. Another summer had come to the hollow and to Granny Height, who had known quite a few herself. The lark sparring flocks and petunias about her house were in their splendor, and Granny, viewing and inhaling them from her doorway, was startled to see a pair of strangers coming through her gate. A draggletail pair, if she ever beheld such. We're hungry, ma'am, said one boldly, as soon as he reached the chestnut slabs that were her doorsteps. He was tall and scrunched shoulder and sad looking. One hand was behind him as if he clutched something hidden. Granny's first thought was that it might be a stolen chicken. Desperately, perishingly hungry, lady, said the other, who was short and fat and smiling. The pangs that he spoke of didn't seem to jibe with the plump waistband. Like all dwellers in the hollow, Granny had an infixed distrust of strangers, but a hungry mortal was a privileged one, and there were two in that state. So she responded, You can have whatever's in the house, and if that ain't enough, there's fruit up the trees and eggs in the barn. Come in. I've new bread and wild honey and a pan of milk and corn pone, and oh yes, some pie. Pie, breathed the short, fat stranger. What kind, ma'am? asked the long one, brightening. Pie from fresh cherries, still warm, said Granny, from a slow, even fire. I always bake cherry pie in June. Cherry pie, murmured Baby Cheeks. He closed his eyes, which were little and blue under frosted brows. He opened them, and they were shining. Open face, crossbarred, or covered, he asked. All three ways, said Granny. You can try them all. Baby Cheeks sighed blissfully. As the hungry pair sat down to her well-scrubbed table, she placed pie and bread and butter and honey and milk before them and inquired with a hostess's honest right, Are you two boys tramps? The visitors, who were scarcely boys, swapped glances, ventured baby cheeks, 
Does it shatter our welcome, ma'am, if we are? Land of Beulah? No, cried Granny. I only asked because I've never seen a real tramp, and one of you boys is purely muddy, and the both of you tangled whiskered. Sam fell into the run, said the tall one, his tone mournful, but his jaws moving with gusto. And Horace pulled me out, supplied Sam. Are folks still falling into the run? Maddie's mind darted back. That's how Joel caught me. He fotched me out wetter than a pike. The visitors looked interested, so she enlarged. He went to the December woods to see his trap line, and for the next 60 years, he vowed that I stalked him. I did no such thing. I was on my way to see Posy Tidnanny's new baby. I fell off an icy log, all red scarf, Christmas boots, and 98 pounds of me with a splash that left icicles hanging from halfway to the treetops. Joel was six foot two and single and mighty handsome and graceful in those days. He heard me yell and whipped around and laced back and pulled me out by whatever come first grab. And though we were only on howdy speaking friends at the time, he needed and ranged me so unmercifully and wrapped me in his coat and ran with me in his arms so tight that before he ever got me to his mother's house and my feet into a hot tub, we were in love. Her eyes misted in her withered apple face. She eyed the baby-faced pie muncher with sudden brightening. Was the log you fell off of the same one, I wonder? The mossy log about fifty rods above Grand Sir Beckett's steel? Her hand shot to her mouth. Steel? Steel, said Sam. For one of the few times in her life, Granny fibbed. I mean the, the, the steel place in the run, a kind of pool. She held her breath. In her stretch of creek, there wasn't any such spot. All was cataract and torrent. It was under a high-pointed rock, said Sam, with bayberries around it. That's it, the very place where I landed. Joel, I mean, where he got me. She busied herself at the coffee pot. You boys from Marion Borough might? A bit beyond, replied Horace. His melancholy eyes roved the cabin, which was as neat as frequent Sudson and Brooman could make it. I was to Marion Borough once, Granny determined to steer the conversation away from local subjects. I went with Joel for the fiddling, but he was more of a hand for travel, so he went there twice. Second time, he rolled a hogshead of tobacco with Bide and Grand Sir Beckett. Of course, they had to go by Coal Mountain to get through the trees. Which way did you boys come? Down Peckerwood Ridge, I believe it's called, said Sam. Land of Canaan. That was a scramble, wasn't it? Horace found it so. He lost a chunk of his pants. Granny exclaimed, I better get out my needle. Horace stated, the rupture is in the seat. Do I, I, I mean, is it necessary? He wants to say, does he take him off or just bend? Asked Sam happily. I've nothing for him to put on, so he bends, said Granny. Joel was buried in his Sunday pants, and I burned the others. Take your time eating. I'll be whacking a patch out of an old apron. How old are you two? Sam's 62, said the tall one. I'm 64. Granny nodded from her sage elevation of a score of years beyond. What do you do for a living? We work for the government. Granny almost jumped out of her skin. Sam spoke quickly. Horace puts things very bluntly. We aren't reveneers. No, agreed Granny, getting her poise back. I can see you ain't spry enough for that. Well, what do you do for the government? Said Horace. We listen, mainly. You what? We listen. What do you hearken to? To an amazing lot of foolishness. And fiddle-faddle, tossed in Sam, and balderdash. We do this strange to say, sitting in Black Mother Hubbard's. If Horace had his now, he wouldn't need your needle. Now all that, said Granny, biting a thread, don't make sense. You're paid for such light work? Sighed Sam, we are. She considered as she threaded her needle, then what fetches you here to our holler? 
We're on vacation, said Sam, a walking trip. We've been following the ridges. It's a change from Washington. And a wonderful release from listening, said Horace. You get tired of harking? We do. The way he said it was like Elder Elisha Martin lining out an amen. Granny felt sort of hashed up in her own house, too. Then I take it I'm not to talk either. I was going to say, have more pie. Dear lady, hastily assured Sam, Horace makes exception in your case. Talk all you please now and forever, here or anywhere. Granny responded tartly, That's a blessing. The patch is ready, Horace. When you're done eating, you can jackknife over. Sam looked on joyfully as his sorrowful companion curved his length over the back of the stubby mountain chair. As Maddie Height plied her craft, Horace murmured, You and your neighbors are a bit off the beaten pass here, aren't you? We like it that way, flashed Granny, same as our kind did a hundred years ago, and theirs afore that. They came to these parts for something that only the fresh, cool mountains can give. Spoke Sam, I know, peace and neighboring without crowding and a sturdy ancient freedom. My people had it once and let it go. The stitching done, Horace straightened. How much do we owe you, ma'am, for the repairs and the food? Oh, do I have to take a broomstick to you boys to teach you manners, cried Granny. We don't take pay around here for sharing and fending. Where are you two bound for? Fitchville at present. There's a gap through the mountain at the top of this run, isn't there? I've heard tell there is. She gave Sam and Horace the rest of the pie for a snack later and watched them go. It was only the first lot of strangers that Granny was to see within the twelfth month. Before cherries were ripe again, she had her second batch, although they had nothing to do with the first, but it showed how the hollow was altering. This new lot was announced one day by a brisk young man in a flannel shirt and high-laced boots. He lifted hat politely when she answered his knock. Good morning, ma'am. May we brush out a stake line across your land? What for? asked Granny, astonished. Preliminary state highway survey. Granny blinked. The engineers figure that through traffic will save 18 miles or approximately 30 minutes if the new road goes down Cat Track Hollow and around Coal Mountain. Granny reached for a halt of her chair, the one Horace had been over. Who sent you here? Highway Commission. Yours is the first house we've come to. He looked at it admiringly. Chestnut and cedar timbers, aren't they? You're really tucked away here. May we proceed? Land of Dan, said Granny faintly, growing good and angry. No, but it will mean great things for this valley. What kind of things? The young man smiled patiently. Why, progress, cars by the dozens, gasoline pumps, ends. You people will have a chance to make real money, selling off your backwoods stuff, furniture, weavings, down by the roadside. He slowed down under her steady frown. Who owns the piece below yours, ma'am? You don't know who? You haven't talked to him? No, we came in from above and are working down. Grandsir Beckett owns that piece. He's a terrible fast man with a squirrel gun. He don't hold with poking about in his laurel. Good Lord, do we have to call on the governor and the militia? Granny's eyes grew snapping bright. For the second time, she did a little fibbing. She knew exactly where Grandsir was, and it wasn't where she pretended. Shouldn't be surprised if Grandsir was to come through the rhododendrons any minute. If I was a trespasser, I'd get. Yes, ma'am. We are instructed to avoid trouble, if any, and leave argument to the lawyers. A cold prickle struck Granny, though the day was warm. Lawyers. The holler didn't have any such, but she felt ashamed of herself being rude to the young man on her doorstep. Any more in your party? Three, they're waiting down by the creek. Call them, and I'll give each of you a big piece of strawberry shortcake. Grandsir Beckett is a terrible fighter, but he won't shoot sitting men. 
The way those bronzed, healthy fellows tore into her shortcake did her a heap of good. It reminded her of the two strangers of the year before, but her mind had clomped swift and hard against letting them run lines across her land. They accepted this with, We'll report what you tell us, ma'am. As the leafage closed behind them, she called, Nathan Beckett, come out of that lean tour. Grandsir came out. He hadn't exactly run away from trouble. He'd only sidestepped it a mite, as a man's apt to do who's 96 and bashful. Happening to pass by moments earlier, he'd stopped in because he smelled the cookery. Tell me what that talk means, said Granny fiercely. It means change. Is that good like they say or bad like I think? It's bad. Highways, said Grandsir Beckett, shuddering, are awful things. I crossed one once at Marion Borough. Great charging chariots chased me four full furlongs afore I reached the other side. If the highway comes down our holler, will it be full of such rush and scurry and beller and stench and be nastying of all the pretty places? They'll lay axe to the grand trees? to maples that turn ready gold in fall and oaks that has been marching up slope and down like British redcoats these hundreds of years. It's a time of fearful trouble ahead for the hauler. Nathan Beckett, how you fixing to deal with this problem? I'll put up a sign, keep out, traps and set guns, prosecutors will be violated, that will tell them. Twon't be enough. They'll be back with soldiers and lawyers and axes. There's going to be ripping, rending, and uprooting, the end to things long loved and deep enjoyed. They'll crash through fern and laurel, right smack through your own chop barrel and copper worm. I haven't any such, cried Grandsir. He added, I'll go now and move them higher up the cove. I, said Granny, am going down to the store and talk to Amos Toller. Even before she reached the store, she could see that the news was there ahead of her. A dozen persons were on the porch, craning at a Marionboro newspaper tacked to the wall. It says here, Link Yawkey's voice cracked, three lanes wide. Bide Beckett traced the words with his stump of finger. Well, said Granny arriving, what are we hollerers going to do about it? Hold a meeting, a whole lot of meetings. Keep them out like our people always have done with government folk. Amos Toller came to his doorway. Postmaster and delegate to Republican state conventions, he was the respected eyes and ears of the settlement. Friends and neighbors, he canceled. This here has been a long spell of coming, but it's inevitable. Ever since our forefathers left Tidewater, clumb Smoky Gray Mountain, and strode down Frothy Run, this republic has been on the march by Indian Trace, Buffalo Trail, Cart Road, and finally by Turnpike. Here in this deep holler, some turned aside to catch breath. It's a snug, pleasant valley, but progress, though sometimes slower than the Link Yawkey's mill wheel, though it often balks and grunts, it lurches on. And what about my mill? Link Yawkey was taller than most, his voice higher too. This says the run will be straightened between concrete banks, and the map shows it going slam through my mill. Where will you folks take your turns of corn to? It shows an, an, an abutment made out, Philoria Vasey, right where the meeting ground is, right on the pulpit. I tell you we're beat, insisted Amos. Government's a powerful thing. When it tells us move over, we have to pull our toes back or be trod on, same as Shawnees and Cherokees afore us. The word government did something to Granny. She recalled her other visitors, those of a year back. They worked for the government. Amos told her, how far is Washington? A right smart steam ride. The storekeeper was puzzled at her vigor. Why, Maddie? You're going to hitch up right now and drive me to Marion Borough and the cars. No, there's hens to feed and stockings to wash. And somebody will have to promise to water my garden. The weather's hotting up. But you be ready, Amos, good and early tomorrow morning. For the train, Maddie? I don't understand. Amos, you be here. She was at his store at daybreak. 
the road down the run, over and around rocks, into potholes, and out of splashy places was known to Amos like the littered shelves of his store. But before long, it was somewhat new to Granny. Alders and sugar maples, sycamores, and birches caught the sun up. The lace and rays stirred warm scent of dying strawberry leaves, of clover and ripe hay, of elder and sweetbriar. Jolting jarring miles of that, and they turned up beside little Piney. She exclaimed with delight when the buggy wheels climbed into glades of fir and pungent junipers. She caught breath and clung tight to the side rail when they came out on a shoulder of coal mountain and gazed down on the hazy dark hills, twisty valleys, and winding water gaps. She had nigh forgotten what a big world it was. At Marion Burrow, she was dizzied by the clatter. The hurly-burly was all Grand Sir had said, and she set her jaw. They learned at the depot that there wouldn't be a train for hours, so she made Amos search out the house of an old hollow neighbor who had married here in town. There she napped and supped, sending Amos homeward, and the friends took her again to the depot. The train came, and they, full of wonder, put her on it. The hour was night. The jounce and sway terrified Granny at first, but she got used to it and found spirit to take in the details of her car. Twenty-four double seats on each side, with a window to each seat, and many people, all strangers to her, most of them asleep, and starry sky and black countryside flowing past the glass. The man with the pliers who took her ticket said he'd tell her when they came to Washington. She, too, must have fallen asleep from the rocking motion and the drum of the wheels. The world was blue above, green below. Her friends had put a paper box of sandwiches in her hand. She ate with relish. She watched the world rush past. Here it was, said the man who took tickets, Washington. More frightened than ever at Marion Borough, but not a body to let on about it, she got down. The depot was almost big enough to cover Peckerwood Mountain. She found her way outside and looked about for a lift. A number of young men lolled against waiting vehicles. One tipped his hat. She said, I want to find two men named Horace and Sam, and they ain't revenuers. She described them. The young man pondered. It was a mite beyond his intellects. Horace, she repeated, and Sam. They sit in black mother hubbards. They just hearken. That's what they do, and they get paid for it. The young man nodded vigorously. He closed the door of his horseless vehicle on her and was off with a jerk that pinned her to the back of the seat like an owl to a barn door. It nearly cost her the rest of her wits. He drew up with a swoop and said, that will be 30 cents. She looked up a flight of white steps. There were marble pillars at the top. For such shabby tramps, her visitors of last summer certainly did business in a mighty fine house. She refused to climb so many steps. There must be 40, she decided, mounting between two flagpoles. So she looked for a cellar door and found one under the steps. Within was a wide room, forested with square pillars. Folks in the place talked in whispers. She peeked into a side room. There were desks and telephones and a number of young men sitting on the desk. She said to one, I'm Mrs. Joel Height of Cat Track Hollow. Can you tell me where to find two men named Horace and Sam? You're who, ma'am? asked the young man, getting up off the desk. His ferret face showed politeness. I'm Granny Height. If you've ever been within 40 mile of the holler, you've heard of me. I'm looking for two men named Horace and Sam. She described them, said another young man pushing in. This is only Dawkins of the United Press. He hasn't been around much. How do you do, Granny? I'm Clinger of the AP. He asked her to describe the men again. Why do you want to find these two persons? Because I know them. They came to my house and ate pie. Horace had torn his pants. I sewed them while he bent over. They said their job was to listen, and I mean to ask them to. A dozen young men were around Granny now finished granny. The state is fixing to build a cement pike across my farm, and I aim to tell those two to stop such nonsense. The young man named Klinger asked the others rather sharply to control themselves. These, uh, these two Sam and Horace called upon you in the hollow? 
We had a real nice visit, but now I need their help. Why is everybody whispering in this place? If Sam and Horace are taking naps at this time of the day, somebody had just better wake them up. Granny, we are about to go into the presence, said Klinger. May I offer you my arm? I can walk without help. Still, she found herself on his arm. They moved to a cage that went up to another floor and walked down a room almost as big as the railroad station, and Klinger handed her through a pair of oak doors into a room with a fancy ceiling higher than Haman's gallows. It had seats for about 300 people. The seats faced a platform with a red plush curtain. High-backed empty chairs stood up there in front of the curtain. The room filled. A man in a blue suit gave a bark, and everybody stood. Granny came to her feet, too, plucked there by Klinger and Dawkins. The curtains parted in three places, and nine men strode in. The one in the middle and the one at the end were the pair Granny knew. Land of Sheba, she exclaimed, like they said, they're in skirts. Faces turned her way. The man in blue wrapped a railing smartly and glowered at her. Granny, indignant at his uppity manner, stared right back. The man in blue cleared his throat and said something in sing-song like Scott Poundstone, the auctioneer. The nine men in black gowns dropped to their chairs on the platform. At another rap, the visitors in the room sat down too, except Granny. She stayed on her feet. She called, Good morning, Horace. You too, Sam. Horace lifted his sorrowful head. Sam jerked his cheery face around. A second man in a blue suit made a dive for her, pushing past many persons to do it. It seemed to her that Klinger and Dawkins kind of melted away. The man in blue had her elbow. You take your hand off of me. Granny was amazed at such manners. Horace, tell him who I am. Horace was regarding her in a most thoughtful, if perplexed, way. Sam, leaning over two black-robed men, pulled his sleeve and whispered something. To the man with her elbow, Granny declared, exasperated, Stop that tugging. I'd like to take a switch to you. Horace, Sam, I've come from Cat Track Hollow to talk to you boys. I want you to earn your pay and hark to me. Horace of the long grave face rose and bowed. He said, Mrs. Hyatt, how do you do? The marshal will show the lady to my chambers and make her comfortable. I will personally see her later. The hand on her elbow fell as if scorched. Horace added pleasantly, I trust things are all right in the hollow. No, they're not. They're terrible, responded Granny promptly. The state wants to put a turnpike through. It wants to set an abutment on our preaching grounds. It wants to put Cat Track Run in a cement ditch and chop down all the bayberries where Sam fell in. The room grew murmurous. One of the nine on the platform said testily, Is this case on the order list? Is this woman qualified to address this bench? Me? Qualified? demanded Granny, astonished. Did I ask you, Horace, were you on any list of mine when you bent over a chair and had me put in that patch? The men in black robes fell to coffin. The room was in a stir. Qualified? Granny was launched. You, Horace, and you, Sam, ate my cherry pie, didn't you? Was I qualified then? Mrs. Hyatt, you certainly were, said Horace. You boys told me your job was to listen. Well, I don't aim to wait till later. I ask you to hearken now, stated Horace to the row on the platform. I believe we should yield to this petitioner. I request my colleagues to indulge me a moment. Sam and the others crossed knees, folded arms, and sat back. Proceed, Granny. Horace's voice was kindly. Though I must inform you that the matter is one which the Constitution reserves to the several states, but before this tribunal, the plea of the individual for justice does not go unheeded. You say the highway people plan to rip through your lovely valley. From end to end, straight through all that's dear to us, bayberry and elder, oak and maple, gristmill and meat and ground. And the people of the hollow don't want it. Won't their doorsteps skewed around that have been in place a hundred years? 
Won't the meadows and the sweet places paved over and the blessed silence turned into denful squawking so folks can get from Fitchville to Marion Borough 30 minutes quicker? No, Horace, we don't want it, but we haven't been asked about it. That's why I'm here. Horace looked grave. He responded, I repeat, this is not the forum for the matter under discussion, but these walls are a mighty sounding board and have echoed in their time to many anxious voice, giving them force and range. In free America, the right of a community to decide its own way of life deserves to be respected. Surely the great state involved will give weight to the wishes of the worthy citizens of this mountain hollow. Some islands of repose in our hurrying civilization, some living fragments of a simpler time, are precious and should not be plundered heedlessly. Getting from Marion Borough to Fitchville is important, but so is the integrity of the quiet places. I have interrupted you, Mrs. Hyatt. Will you go on with your own views later in my chambers? Granny was almost speechless. Why, Horace, I don't have to tell you anything more. You've said it all better than I could do it myself. Thank you, Mrs. Hyatt. If then your business with us is finished, and I dare say it is, Granny felt herself being ushered out of the room by the man in blue ever so politely and gently, and an instant later she was surrounded by Klinger and Dawkins and a dozen other young men, some of whom yelped, She's mine! I saw her first! The young men stayed close, asking a power of questions, and they scribbled down her answers, madly chattering, wonderful. Who is grandsir? You say he's 96 and still knocks squirrels out of trees? What's your recipe for that pie? How long did the chief justice bend over that chair? Didn't you let him have the needle just one ramps? When she was out on those white steps, there were shouts of, Hold it, Granny! Look mad! Now smile! There! Let's have another! Granny hadn't come to Washington to have her picture taken or to be jostled this way. She was growing really mad when Klinger, with a whispered invitation, whisked her off to meet his wife in a tiny apartment and to sit, resting and rocking and answering more questions about the hollow while he banged a typewriter. Mrs. Klinger insisted on her staying for lunch, which they fixed together in the little kitchen. Afterwards, she had a nice nap. When she awoke, a big box of roses had come with a card that said, Affectionately, Horace and Sam. And Klinger had a big surprise for her. He said the president wanted to meet her, and he took her to a house she'd heard about all her life. There she found Horace and Sam also. This time, not in their black gowns, but not quite as they'd looked at her house either. The three had a wonderful visit, and Granny, before she was taken away, met the President's wife also, and they swapped recipes for cherry pie, open face, and crossbarred, and kivered. Klinger was waiting, and again insisted on taking her home with him, where she spent the night. Toward noon, he and Mrs. Klinger took her to the depot. As they rolled through the street, Mrs. Klinger pointed out the front of the theater to her. White letters above the doorway said, Granny Height sets Supreme Court in uproar. We have time, said Mrs. Klinger. Let's go in. It was something new for Granny to walk into a theater, but her astonishment was nothing compared to when she saw, on a screen up there in front of her, the spitting image of herself standing on the white steps between the flagpoles, repeating her plea for cat track holler to those men with the pencils. But she felt a stir like a buzzing of bees deep inside her when Horace's picture sprang hugely with letters under it saying, In free America, the right of a community to decide its own way of life deserves to be respected. When she'd been put on the steam car, she opened the newspapers Klinger had bought for her. There, to her amazement, were pictures of the holler, two whole pages of them, of the cabin she had lived in all the years since Joel built it for her, a bride, of Amos and his store, and Link and his mill, and Grandsir with his rifle gun, and Levisy Tidnanny holding up the very apron she, Mattie Hyatt, had cut that patch out of. There was also a picture of the governor taken at the state capitol and a statement from him in black type that the private view which the Chief Justice of the United States had put into such fitting words were his own exactly, and the folks of Cat Track Hollow could feel at rest. 
the pike would find another route. Granny Hyatt was mighty relieved about that, but all the way home she had something else to worry about. When Amos met her at Marion Burrow and helped her into the dusty old buggy, she didn't mention it. Just the same, she worried. As soon as he had set her down at his store and she'd been kissed and hugged by the women and had her hand wrung by the men, she hurried up the path to her home. Sure enough, her fears were fulfilled. That rifle-toting, old scamp, Grandsir, had forgotten his promise to keep her garden watered and her larkspur, flocks, and petunias all were wilted. She went to the bank of the run and sat down and harked to the murmur of the starlit water. It was a happy sound. The stream wasn't going to be pinched between walls. Bayberries and ferns would go on crowding it. Sycamores and birches would link arms over it. This fold in the mountains would stay as her people had known it for another turn of years anyhow. Well, I hope you enjoyed the ending of Granny Height, the Nine Brides and Granny Height. I did my usual little spill where I talk about my thoughts and something happened to it. So here I am, different day, but I'm going to recap what I, what I read for you this last part of the book. I really enjoyed this book. I hope you did. I hope you did as much as I do. And I'm so thankful to the person that suggested it. It was actually a YouTube subscriber that suggested I read it, and I'm so glad they did. This part was really, just like the entire book, really interesting. The author has uh, such good, as far as describing things, just makes you feel like you were there, you know. Uh, the very beginning of this part, of course, was the ending of Zelda and the her getting everybody to vote. How heartwarming, so heartwarming that the flag, you know, and then it's going to stay in the school and that she got everybody there. Even um, Mrs. Gunderson that they had to carry down. The part about they said that she was four axe handles wide. Maybe not, a lot of people might not think that was very nice, but that was just how they were describing her. But that's something that I've heard in my lifetime. I've heard people say that, use that as far as a measurement, axe handle wide. I've heard that. So that one's still alive and well here in the mountains of Appalachia. I've heard Matt say it even recently. So then we'll get to the part where Granny's, Granny's having to leave Cat Track Holler to, to, you know, to save the day beautiful descriptive part of her the sam and horace they're coming to her house and eating i love that part you could just see both of them the the differences in their uh, physical appearance and then the way they you know what they said and granny having to sew up his pants and all that really descriptive i loved it and I especially enjoy, though, once Granny's going to decide she's got to do something when the, she meets the second people that come to the holler. And she gets Amos Toller to take her to the train when she's leaving. She's leaving Cat Track Hollow. She's coming to go all the way to Marion Burrow to get on the train. I really love how she describes, you know, she suddenly realizes the world's much bigger than what she remembered. She'd forgot because she hadn't hadn't been out in so long. And so she's just amazed by the views and by the difference. And of course, once they get to town, she's kind of overwhelmed by the noise and the thinking Grandsir was right about all the stuff he said. So I really, really enjoyed that part. And it reminded me of, uh, you know, there's just different, we're all, we all have personal preferences. There's different people, uh, different strokes for different folks, they say. And there's a lot of people like Granny Hyatt that's like, I don't, I don't really need to travel. I don't, I'm pretty satisfied where I'm at and, you know, everything's okay and I just don't even think about it. And then there's the people that have wanderlust and they want to, you know, have a bucket list with all the, maybe the countries or the states or whatever that they want to travel to. And both people are right. There's nothing wrong with either one of them. Uh, Granny Height, though, reminded me of a, a man that I grew up, he was friends, him and his wife, with Granny and Pap. Their kids grew up with me and my brothers, and um, he lived back back yon way over the mountain there in Moccasin Creek, and it's probably been about 10 years ago or something, and he di had died, and I didn't know, but Steve was up here visiting with us, and he told us, you know, hey, did you, you know he died? And I said, no, I didn't. So, of course, we got to talking about m memories and stories and things like that, and Steve said, you know, one time I heard him say that he had never been no further than Asheville. He never traveled any further than Asheville. Well, right here, Asheville, that's Asheville, North Carolina. So right here where we live, or over the mountain there where he would live, you could say it was two and a half hours to Asheville at the most, you know, if you're, you're doing pretty good, two and a half hours. So when Steve said that, you know, I thought, wow, 
two ways to look at it. And one way you kind of say, well, I feel sorry for him. He never seen the ocean. You know, maybe he never, you know, got to go overseas or something like that. Or, you know, got to go out west and see the canyons. But the other way of looking at it is I thought he never needed to. Now, he wasn't a man that was, like, incapable of going places. He could have. He worked a good job, had a retirement, you know, those kind of jobs. He could have went anywhere he wanted to if he if he had wanted to. So that's the point. I remember I thought, I don't know whether to be feel sorry for him or to be jealous of him, that he never needed anything except what was right here. Uh, there's something very powerful in that to think about. Uh, but I can certainly understand the people that have the wanderlust and want to see all the beautiful, amazing places. I see that side, too. So I really liked that part. Granny Height, um, the other part I liked was once she got to Washington there, how she just assumed that everybody knew who she was, you know. Uh, that ties into, you could see... Um, mentally there how it ties into her not realizing the world was as big as it was that you know of course they would know who she was and who grand sir beckett was and who amos toller was and toller's store why wouldn't they you know it kind of ties into that part but the way that she just assumed everybody would uh, realize who she was reminded me a lot of course of um jed and granny on the clampets you know the Beverly Hillbillies because they never could understand why the people there in Hollywood didn't understand ever when they would talk about somebody from back home or the way things were they just thought they would understand it too so that's just a, a comical bit there it's a really good story uh, the whole book has been but Granny's story uh, it's a good story because it has a happy ending you know she saved the hollow saved the holler there uh, at the very end of the book, it says that she saved it. Even she realizes she can't save it forever. She says for a turn of years. So even she realized that um, it's not going to be permanent. But at least she pushed it. At least she pushed that, that road back, you know. And so that's how we wish it could always happen, but it doesn't. And so many things come to my mind. Of course, you know, change, we can't. I don't, I'm somebody that don't like change. Like, I'm really ordered and set in my ways, kind of. And change makes me uh, uncomfortable. Thinking about, like, even, this is so silly. This is how my, how I am, though, how I work. Like, I'm not spontaneous at all. I don't even like change. Like if, if today, like I've got my day kind of planned out what I'm going to do. And if somebody called me and said, hey, you want to, so-and-so's on at the movies. And I think it'd be really fun. And we could go watch the movie and go out to eat and blah, blah, blah. You know, even if it was something I really wanted to do, my first instinct is to say, well, no, I didn't plan it. I can't go if I didn't plan it. Like I want to know. That's how bad I, how I, I don't mesh well with change. But since the beginning of time there's been change and there's and there, a lot of times there is no stopping it like granny granny height was able to of course the things that come to mind for me is uh, you know when i think about my region of the world where i live I, I think about you know the removal of the cherokee they couldn't eventually they couldn't stop it and that changed their whole life um, and then even on after them i think about the changes that affected more i guess more of uh, what i would say my people is the you know the TVA dams and the Smoky Mountain National Park those things the the government took those took that land you know you could say with well, the TVA dams well Tipper it's so that you could have electricity today and that's true that's where my electricity comes from but but they still took their land to do that and I know that had to be such heartbreak for them and, and you know and I've, I've read so many accounts of people in the park that that you know that they took theirs and it's just a it's just change. It's like what was coming for Granny's Hollow there, but she, she stopped it. You know, it, of course, it's fiction book. But most of the time in real life, those, you can't, there's no stopping it. It happens. And, some, you know, gradually over time, there's lots of little changes. But sometimes there are those really quick, severe changes of, like, thinking about the park or the T TVA lakes. And, and those are by no means not the only times those things have happened. But those are the ones closest to my mind and closest to my area that I think of. Even right now... Blairsville Highway, if you're a local person, Blairsville Highway, they're widening it. And so to do that, they've had to take people's houses and they've had to take some businesses. A lot of some places you can see where they've got stakes in people's yards and they've basically took their whole yard. It's going to take it all. And it's, you know, they're going to where maybe they had, 
I don't know, 100 yards in front of their house, you know, before you reach the main highway. Now it's going to be more like, you know, it's just like almost uh, just about 10 yards or something right in front of their door, and the rest of it's not going to be there. So, you know, drastic changes like that happen, and um, I guess as the sprawl of man continues, they'll just continue to happen. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons. Like I said, you can say, like, well, about the electricity, Tipper, would you rather have electricity or not have never had a TVA lake? Um, so those are all things that, that you think about. Uh, but also, not just with those changes like that or, or like the road, the example of the road, how they were going to, you know, they're, they're not just building that for the fun of it. There's more people here. The population has increased, and they think that it, w it needs to be widened because that's a really traveled highway. So you can see that. So it's like as population increases and man sprawls further, all those changes um, affect people. It's really heartwarming, though, to think about Granny Heights stopping it. Like I said, even though it was just fiction, it makes a really good story, a really good story. So I hope that you enjoyed this book, like I said, as much as I did. Please leave a comment and let me know what jumped out at you, what you enjoyed the most in this last little part. And I hope you'll drop back by next week. We're going to start another book, and we're going to start a Christmas book. And I haven't decided yet, but I'm, I'm toying with it in my mind. It might be really nice to to actually finish it by Christmas, kind of, you know, and if I do that, though, I'm either going to have to read long, longer, or maybe offer two readings a week, and then you could just read, you could just listen to it anytime you wanted to. You wouldn't have to have to listen to it the day that I put it up. You, that'd just be your choice, and even if you wanted to stretch them out till after Christmas. So I'm still playing around with that, but I will definitely be sharing another book next Friday, and maybe even before then, but again, you would, you'd see the little notice and be able to see but I'll continue to read on Fridays for sure. Thanks for, for listening to The Nine Brides and Granny Hyatt.